book of the month. Follow the link to buy your copy. During the months of July and August, we'll be looking at John Knox, Scotland's reformer. If you'd like to learn more about John Knox, and there is a lot to learn, there's plenty of resources online. And if you prefer books, a good starting point is an excellent little primer, John Knox, Fearless Faith, by Stephen Lawson. It's just 100 pages, and it's packed with fast-moving information about Knox. And there's a link to buy the book on www.semper-reformata.com throughout July and August. Just follow the link in the episode notes. The book costs just £5.49. A small part of that goes to support this podcast. The Book of the Month, John Knox, Fearless Faith, by Stephen Lawson. Hi, this is Bob here. This catechism class is going live on Tuesday, the 5th of July, 2022. And I need to let you know that the catechism class will be taking a summer break at Ballymacashan. And so our next episode on the podcast will be in early September. Don't worry, though. There will be plenty of other contributions and content on the podcast over the summer months, including the weekly news and prayer update every Monday at 8am. There will be a weekly sermon episode and there will be some historical stuff as well. Okay. So let's get on with our catechism lesson for today. Welcome to our catechism class. It's a weekly look at the Heidelberg Catechism to help you learn Christian doctrine with a warm and practical application. Each lesson has its own study guide, and the web link to find that guide can be found in the episode notes. Okay, let's start the lesson. So, welcome to our Catechism class. It's Lord's Day 21, question 54. And we're asking, when is it time to say goodbye? We've been looking at the Christian church, and in our last class, we learned that the Bible knows nothing of a lone Christian, or a spiritual gypsy, or a church shopper, or a mega church pew warmer. We find that biblical church membership is a total practical, financial, and prayerful commitment to the work of the Lord among a local group of believers, and submission to stated elders within that group and regular attendance at the worship of that group. And essentially, that church membership is not by any means a saving ordinance, although it may demonstrate evidence of saving grace in one's life. So let's remind ourselves once again of our catechism question and answer. Question 54. What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Christian Church? Our answer is, I believe that the Son of God, out of the whole human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, defends, and preserves for himself by his Spirit and Word in the unity of the true faith, a church chosen to everlasting life. And I believe that I am, and forever shall remain, a living member of it. But thinking about the visible church and the local church, we now need to ask an important question. What if I join a local church and after some time I find that I really don't fit in? Well, that's actually a serious issue, and we're going to look at it in this episode. I'm Bob McAvoy, and this is the Semper Reformata Podcast. I suppose it could be argued by some that my knowledge of ecclesiology may be somewhat limited, but my knowledge of not fitting in is extensive. After all, for 16 years I was an ordained minister in a Pentecostal denomination. Not fitting in is the very description of my entire ministerial life. 
I have to confess, I almost considered it a part of that ministry, a part of my calling, to be a total pain for those who actually believed what my denomination taught. And eventually, of course, I had to leave for their sake and for mine. So in this podcast, I'm asking, when should I leave my church? And what's a good reason to leave a church? And what's not? So I wonder if we were to conduct a survey about why people leave churches, and I'm thinking specifically here in Northern Ireland where I live, but even further afield, if I were to conduct a survey, what would the survey say? Well, I think one of the very first things that I would hear, and high in our survey list, would be people who say, I'm leaving my church for the sake of the children. And I say that because I've heard this over and over again right throughout my Christian ministry. It's for the sake of the children, Pastor. But why should the most spiritually immature members of the family, well, one would hope they would be the most spiritually immature members of the family, why would they be able to influence the family's worship practices? Back in 2011, I wrote a blog post on the semper-reformata.com blog site addressing that issue. Back then, I'd been a Christian minister for around 30 years, and most of that ministry was spent in small rural churches, small churches. In the blog post, I wrote, I've lost count of the times I've had a conversation with a church member that went something like this. Pastor, I'm sorry to tell you that we're going to have to leave the church. Now, please understand that it's nothing you have said or done. We have not been offended or anything like that. No, it's not your preaching either, brother. In fact, we've enjoyed your ministry very much and found it very helpful. And we feel that we have grown spiritually here. And we really miss all our friends here at the church. We've been attending here for many years. And it would be a great wrench to have to leave our friends. But we do have to leave. Why have we to leave, Pastor? Oh, I thought you would know. It's for the sake of the children. In fact, what had happened was that the big church up the road had more young people, had better youth organisations, had more youthful worship, had more people to help with activities and more money to spend on those activities, had better high-tech facilities, or maybe they had sound bite sermons or a praise band or clowns who danced before each hymn, or maybe they had a dedicated full-time youth pastor. Whatever. Inevitably, the people concerned left the church fellowship where their faith had been nurtured for years and went to another church, maybe even one that believed totally different doctrines and in some cases was actually the very opposite of where they had previously worshipped. And they did it in this strange hope that moving church would keep their children interested in Christianity, would keep them within the church, in the hope that one day they might be saved. You can read my response to that frequent scenario on the blog. You'll find the link in the episode notes for this podcast. Frankly, I consider this as a failure of parenting. It's a parent's duty to teach their children what Christian worship is about. It's a parent's duty to enable them to be participators in the worship. And furthermore, the worship of the church is not about age. It's not about what appeals to any specific generation. It's about honouring God. It's all about Jesus. Well, the second reason we might find in our survey is someone saying, I don't like the worship worship wars. And that's not just contemporary versus traditional either. Although if the church is singing songs that are not full of biblical content, or have dubious links to the new apostolic reformation, for example, that could arouse a curiosity to explore further those groups on the fringes of Christianity, that would give concern for how many people have been sucked into toxic organisations like Hillsong and Bethel Reading by their music. Sometimes people say, I have to move church because it's too far to travel. Now that, of course, can be legitimate. Perhaps there are better ways to use the financial resources that the Lord has given you than to donate them to BP or some of the other big petroleum companies. Or someone will say, I have to leave church because there's far too many hypocrites in the church. 
my response to that usually is I know, and you're one of them, and so am I. And in that situation, someone should ask the pastor to read Martin Luther and to teach the doctrine publicly, the doctrine of Samuel Eustace et Peccator, teaching the people that we are all sinners and that we all let the Lord down and that we all need constantly to ask for forgiveness having confessed our sins. One of the reasons why people leave churches is because they don't like the dress code. That can work either way, of course. Churches do have different views on what is acceptable by way of dressing when we worship God. In Northern Ireland, until fairly recently, going to church was always considered to be a dressing up occasion. Men would have a Sunday suit and they would wear a tie and they would dress very respectfully. And the women would always have a Sunday dress and a hat. But of course, that's no longer the case in many churches. The trend towards a more casual dress code was changing just after the turn of the century back in the early 2000s. Back then, one of our Dickens would come to church smartly dressed, but with no tie, wearing a pair of jeans and a sports jacket. Tongues in the church began to wag, and I sought counsel about it from one or two of the older brethren. One of them scratched his head, and he admitted to me that it was a difficult issue. After all, he said, his designer jeans cost a lot more than your suit. But dress codes have a deeper, more theological implication, don't they? Do the women in the church wear head coverings? When we come into God's presence, should we not respect the holiness of God by approaching him in a more formal manner of dress? We're taught that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart, and that's certainly so. But I wonder, does God look on the outward appearance as well as the heart? And all of those deeper issues have brought discomfort to Christians and have been given as reasons for people to seek fellowship with Christians who are more like-minded. One of the saddest reasons that I've heard people giving for leaving churches is that there's too much commitment. And I think this is especially relevant to small churches. When I was the pastor of a small church in County Antrim, I was greatly grieved by the fact that a fair number of people would catch a bus twice on a Sunday to attend a mega church 30 miles away. A church where they could enjoy the music and the choir and blend into the crowd anonymously and have a form of Christianity that seemed to have no commitment whatsoever. And if they'd stayed in their local town, if they'd attended a local church, they could have been Sunday school teachers or deacons or musicians or whatever talent the Lord had given them, even just supporting the local work financially and encouraging others with their presence. But even that would have been too much commitment for them. Well, there are six commonly identified reasons for leaving a church. Seldom, in my opinion, are these valid reasons to break fellowship with a true gospel church. Let's remember the Reformers' definition of a church. It was a place where the word of God is properly proclaimed. A place where the sacraments are being rightly observed. A place where church discipline is being rightly maintained. So, if I'm in a church like that, are there any legitimate reasons for leaving it? I find John MacArthur particularly helpful here. And you can find a link to his teaching on the matter in the episode notes. MacArthur gives us some perfectly good reasons why you actually should leave a church. Here they are. Firstly, heresy on some fundamental truth is being taught from the pulpit. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul is totally candid about this. He writes in Galatians 1 and verse 7 to 9, But there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he says it twice. Let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. The literal translation of that would be something like, let him go to hell. That's fairly direct. False doctrine damns souls to hell. And we should avoid it like the plague. Second reason for leaving a church that MacArthur gives 
is when the leaders of that church tolerate seriously errant doctrine from anyone who's given, been given teaching authority in the fellowship. Let's think of the scenario here. The church has an orthodox statement of faith. The church has a pastor and elder who are all sound biblical believers, and yet they allow visiting preachers to occupy the pulpit who are far from sound, unbiblical teaching, seeping into the church body unchecked. Paul writes in Romans 16 and verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offences, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So what if a church leader invites a preacher with, for example, oneness Pentecostal beliefs? Isn't that a good reason to talk to that pastor? Talk to the pastor of the church, and if he won't see sense on the church refusing to tolerate seriously errant doctrine, then it's time to go. MacArthur's third reason is where the church is characterised by a wanton disregard for scripture. For example, a refusal to discipline members who are blatantly sinning. In Corinth, when Paul was writing to the church there, there was blatant sexual immorality being openly practised among the church members. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 to 7. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as to be named among the Gentiles. Verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. If the church refuses to discipline those who are openly sinning, then maybe it's time to go. Here's MacArthur's next reason. Unholy living, tolerated in the church. And that comes in many forms. And Paul gives us some examples of it in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9 to 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, know not to eat. And what if the church is seriously out of step with the biblical pattern for the church? I think this has become a problem in more recent times where churches have self-appointed pastors and elders, where spiritual abuse has taken place, where one man has exercised unrestrained authority without any accountability. You know, the so-called heavy shepherding movement of the 1970s hasn't really gone away. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, Paul says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition that he received of us. MacArthur's sixth reason is that we should leave a church that is marked by gross hypocrisy, a church that is giving lip service to biblical Christianity, but refusing to acknowledge its true power, and I can certainly think of many churches that are very like that, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away, says Paul in Second Timothy 3 and 5. So six common reasons that people leave churches, and six good biblical reasons why a person actually should leave and separate from a local church. I think just not fitting in probably isn't the issue. I probably won't ever perfectly fit in in any church, because thankfully there's not a church anywhere full of people exactly like me. What an awful thought. There'll always be an element of compromise and reasonable acceptance of other people's opinions. But when I don't fit in because of error in the church, or those reasons that John MacArthur listed, then I think it's probably best if I find fellowship elsewhere. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please help to make it better known by opening the podcast app on your phone or mobile device. Then, search for The Semper Reformata Podcast. 
subscribe and give it a 5 star rating. See you next time.